And in this video, I'm going to be walking you guys through a very commonly asked front end system design question, which essentially asks you to build an Asana board or a Jira like springboard. Now, this question can be a tricky one, especially when it comes to dealing with a bunch of these weird edge cases that I will soon cover in this video. So, from a UI example, this is what we are going to be building. It looks something along, the, along these lines where um, you'll have a menu on the left side, then you have your main sprint in the middle, and then you have few columns uh, and then you can create tickets inside of each individual column you can move tickets around and so forth i'll get to the requirements in a moment but i do want to mention that in this video i will try to walk you through everything that you need to know to ace this question so i'll walk you through a system design framework that you can use to structure this question really well i'll walk you through the requirements the architecture the api design the performance considerations the edge cases the security accessibility and finally, internationalization. So there's obviously a lot of topics to be covered in this video, and this video is gonna be discussing each topic at a very high level. But if you want a more in-depth guide on system design for front-end specifically, check out frontendly.com. This is a website that helps you study and prepare for front-end interviews, questions that are commonly asked by top tech companies. And we currently have over 170 questions. There's a lot of questions and a lot of topics to cover. We offer six questions completely for free. You have one centralized platform that you can utilize to ace any front-end interview question. I also offer a free comprehensive guide to mastering front-end system design interview, but it will cover every single front-end topic in depth without even having to sign up. So if you're interested in studying for front-end engineering interview questions, I recommend checking out frontendly.com. We are offering a 20% off discount across all plans. Use the discount code 20 off and that will allow you to get 20 percent off any plan. with that let's get started with the video so we are going to be utilizing the radio framework for this question so the radio framework essentially allows us to break this problem down into smaller steps first it's going to be the requirements then we're going to dive into the architecture design then we're going to design it uh, dive into the data model finally we're going to dive into interface and then last but not least optimizations so now let's look at the basic requirements the functional requirements asks us that we would like to design a UI that looks something along these lines. This specific dashboard will contain four to three columns by default. Um, it will also specify a sprint name for the particular board that we're on. It'll specify a way to add a new ticket to the specific board that you're on and also add a new column. We'll also specify three columns by default and you can always create a new column by pressing the new column button. In each column, we'll specify tickets that can be assigned to various users, and it should allow you to be able to create new tickets, manage existing sprint, reorder the tickets by columns. Remember, the ticket can only be assigned to one user at a time, and also finally allows to create new columns. In terms of scoping, we don't have to really worry about filtering tickets by author. We also don't have to be worried about completing sprints or searching for tickets and so forth. So now let's discuss the non-functional requirements. First and foremost is, do we want to go with a server-side rendering approach or a client-side rendering approach? Now, one of our requirements is performance. We want to make sure things are very performant, but at the same time, we don't also want to over-engineer and over-complicate things because this is a authenticated screen, means, meaning that you have to log in to view the screen. So it might not be super important for SEO purposes. Before I dive into which one is better, I'm gonna just quickly explain server-side rendering versus client-side rendering. So usually if you are building a website where you really care deeply about the initial load performance, you want things to load fast initially, plus you care about SEO, then server-side rendering is probably a better approach. Your initial load will be significantly faster. Um, however, if you're working with a website that's highly interactive, for instance, a chat application that's guarded behind some sort of authentication flow, that, that way, if you're dealing with a lot of interactions, then you want to use client-side rendering because your initial load might be slightly slower, but then you don't have to do additional configuration for the additional interactions that's on your website. So client-side rendering would be a good approach. Now, I think this in this case, it really varies. If we have enough engineers, we have enough resources, maybe we can take, take a hybrid approach where we can do server-side rendering on the initial load and then client-side rendering on the interaction behavior. Obviously, that requires more resources, more engineering, it's more complex, 
Um, so if we don't have that available initially, then I would probably just opt in for a client side rendering because this is guarded behind authentication flow. Uh, but if we do have the additional resources, then I would say yes, yeah, service side rendering initially and then client side rendering for interactive flows. The next non functional requirement here is we want this to be responsive. So because we want this to be responsive, we want to try to use meter queries and try to build our layout in a way where things kind of just shrink and resize automatically. And we don't have to create like a separate mobile app and a separate desktop app and so forth. The next non-functional requirement is that things do not have to be real time, but we can give the illusion of real time. For instance, if I am dragging a ticket from here to here, we don't have to necessarily open a WebSocket connection and like have things update so quickly because you know if the other person is viewing this on their browser uh, and things are moving around, it's not really super crucial for them to get and be aware that things are drag and drop in a new column. Um, so we can probably use some kind of calling system to be able to pull a fresh set of tickets at a specific interval. Um, and then we can also provide shimmers and good loading states so things look nicer as things are initially loading and so forth. Then we want to make sure things are accessibility friendly, performant, and interna internationalization, observability, and tracking. All of this will be covered later in the video. Finally, uh, there's a few edge cases that we want to keep in mind. First is we want to support creating a new ticket, um, and then we want to support infinite scrolling. For infinite scrolling, we'll use something such as an intersection observer, which essentially will allow us to make infinite scrolling a lot more performant. And if you're kind of confused about how intersection observer works, I'll link the video on the screen where I actually walk you through a demo of how to use Intersection Observer. And I also have another video that actually shows you how to build Intersection Observer from scratch yourself. But how Intersection Observer basically works at a high level is that you can specify specific nodes on the DOM to watch for, and you can, specify, you can check the index of where they're currently at, so that if that DOM node essentially uh, becomes visible on the screen, you're aware of that specific node being visible, and then you can do any kind of action, perform action after that. So it's really powerful and performing. Last but not least, we also want to worry about the drag and drop of tickets in real time. So again, we want to give the illusion that things are happening in real time, uh, but we'll discuss these specific edge cases in a moment. So quick overview of the UI. I've already kind of walked you guys through exactly what the main UI looks like, but in terms of uh, dragging, so I can drag a ticket from one column to another. For that, we can use uh, the draggable API from the DOM. Uh, it has a, a drag start, drag end, and so forth. We can make columns uh, and tickets, sorry, draggable. Um, and consider for something for the ticket use cases. So number one, if a ticket is created, it should be in the last item in the in progress section. So for instance, if I press here and I create a new ticket, then we should append that ticket to the very bottom of the um, uh, to do or in, in progress section. Number two, we want to maintain ticket vertical positioning within the column. So this is kind of going hand in hand with point one. Once you append a new ticket, you should not reorder the initial ticket ordering. You should keep them fixed as, they're, as they were received from the server. Next, if a ticket is moved from one column to another, we want to remove that ticket from the previous column and append it to the end of the list for the new column. So for instance, if my done column already had three tickets and I'm going ahead and moving that ticket from my to-do column to my done column, we should append that ticket to the very end, not anywhere in, the, in between the existing tickets. Finally, I just want to show you quickly what the create ticket screen might look like. Once you press create new ticket, it'll open up a modal like this where you can specify the ticket metadata, such as the ID, description, so forth. And when you press create, it'll specify do you want to add this to the current sprint, if so, then you can actually just, it'll just append it to the to-do column. So that is the UI in a nutshell. Now let's talk about the high-level component design here. So because this is a front-end system design interview, we're not really too concerned about our server. We can go into detail later in the interview if we have time. So we're just gonna treat that as a black box for now. Our server essentially is gonna be interacting with our index.js application, which will have our controller in there. And this, I will be using, a for this, I'll be using a model view controller design pattern. So our controller, which is the brain of our application, will be communicating with our server. It will be receiving data and also sending data to the server. 
Our controller will then store that data into a client star, uh, client side store, data model store. And I'll walk you guys through that in a moment of what that will look like. Then our controller will be using that data from the client uh, data model store and then rendering the individual UI views. In our case, we'll have our sprint board view with their child components and then a create composer view and with their own child components. Each child component will have its own set of interactions that will be essentially interacting with the controller. The controller will now be mutating the local state um, for the data model store and then updating the views as needed. Now let's just take a look at a few edge cases that we considered earlier. So the controller will have subcontrollers as well. One of them could be a board controller, which has sub functionality with inside of it. One could be creating a new board. Second could be updating existing tickets. For instance, when we are moving one ticket from one column to another. So how that would basically look like is your ticket will be watching for our drag start function. And then when you drop it to the to another column, we'll call the drag end function. We'll get the new column ID, and then we'll submit an API request to the server so that it knows that, hey, this ticket now belongs to a new column. And then the server will return us a status of like 200 if it's succeeded, or a status of 500 if there's a server error and so forth. And I'll get to the specific API design in a moment. Before we get into the API design, let's just take a look at our options for what sort of protocol we want to utilize for this application. Now, if this is a real systems and interview, I do not recommend actually writing all of this out. This is take, it's going to take you too much time for a real interview. You need to be fast and to the point in a real interview. But this, because this is an educational video, I will walk you through guys. Because this is more of an educational video, I will walk you guys through each individual option and then we'll pick. So the first is polling and uh, long polling and so forth and RESTful endpoints. Uh, the benefits there is that it offers HTTP2. Um, the benefits there is that it offers HTTP2, uh, which comes with all of the nice headers. Um, it's easy to load balance. There ha it has built-in firewall protection and so forth. Um, the downside there is it's it's slower. Um, you know, there's more overhead. You have to uh, do a larger request and response. But it is a good option, and it's one we might consider. The second is WebSockets. WebSockets are extremely fast. Um, they are one singular TCP connection that's communicating back and forth with the server. However, they are expensive. Uh, it takes up a lot more memory on the server and on the client to keep this connection open. You have to also create all these firewalls and load balancing yourself. It's not HTTP, it's not HTTP2 friendly, so it doesn't support multiplexing out of the box. So you have to kind of horizontally scale and build all of these tools up yourself. Last but not least is GraphQL. It offers us all of the benefits of HTTP2, um, but it also offers us additional benefits, for instance, pulling the data that we specifically need. It allows us to connect different nodes and pull them together. However, that could result in higher possible latency if you end up requesting too much data from the server. Last but not least, the benefit there is that it is type friendly. So for this case, I think we will move forward with a combination between GraphQL and some sort of like interval-based polling using GraphQL. And the reason I say this is because our initial load can use GraphQL to pull our data. We can use GraphQL mutations to uh, update our existing board. But for instance, if we want to um, pull in fresh board items, maybe given every like 30 seconds to a minute, if other teams are making updates, then we can do a polling and pull GraphQL data every interval or so to get a fresh set of results. Now that's obviously optional, it depends on your system requirements. It's kind of out of scope for this video, but that is an option to consider when you are talking about this interview. Okay, now let's talk about the API design. This is probably gonna be the most important part of this video because it, it really helps us set up exactly how we're gonna be implementing infinite scrolling too. Um, so basically, the, the chunk of it here is uh, pulling the current board. I'm going to work on this last because the other items are actually a lot easier to discuss. So first, let's discuss creating new tickets. So we're going to be doing a post request, and we're going to create a new mutation called create ticket, which takes in the input of create ticket input. And here, we can specify the ticket metadata, such as title, points, and so forth. And then specify an optional board ID if you want to specify it to a particular board. Otherwise, it's going to go specifically right into the backlog. Uh, then we want to discuss moving tickets, which essentially is another uh, mutation called transaction transition ticket, which takes in a ticket transact 
opportunity. Then we want to talk about, then we want to deal with moving existing tickets. This will be a post request. It will be a mutation called transaction ticket, which will take in an input of ticket transaction input. This looks something like this, where we can specify the particular board ID that we are trying to move our tickets within. It can specify the ticket ID that we are essentially aiming to move to. Last but not least, it specifies the target column that we want to move our ticket into. Last but not least, we can also deal with creating new columns. I forgot to discuss this earlier, but this is an optional question that could be asked. Would work similarly to creating new tickets, but in this case, we'll create a new mutation called create column, which takes in a create column input. In this input, we can specify the board ID and the name of the specific ticket, uh, sorry, the name of the specific column that we're trying to create. Now, let's look at the chunk of the work, which is essentially creating, I mean, sudden. Let's look at the chunk of the work, which is pulling our current board. So for that, we'll create a get request, which will be a GraphQL query that gets the board. So the get board input will look like so. We can specify a board ID, which is required to pull a specific board. A limit and page, which are for paginating, essentially creates an offset to specify what particular offset of results that you want to pull. Now, how do we actually deal with pulling in individual tickets especially when it comes to paginating. That's kind of a complex question because think about it, if you have multiple columns and you've already loaded your initial set of results and then you start scrolling, how do you know what column might have more tickets uh, on the next page and which columns to actually pull tickets for? So we need to come up with a more sophisticated solution here. So our response will essentially look something like this. So we will return our board information so the board will contain the title of the board, description of the board, and any other board metadata. Then it will return a list of columns. This columns will specify each individual column information, such as the ID or the name, and so other metadata that it can contain. And then we'll have a separate field called tickets that will actually have a list of tickets available. And how this will work is that this tickets list will contain a bunch of tickets and then each ticket will specify its own unique column ID. And on the client, we will map that column ID to the specific column that it matches to based off the columns list. How this will enable us to, this will really help us when it comes to infinite scrolling because backend can deal with all of the sophisticated logic to determine which tickets to return the client simply just needs to map those tickets back to the column, and then all of the infinite scrolling should just work as expected. So that will be our API response in a nutshell. Now let's talk about the next topic here, which is performance. So in terms of performance, there's several topics we can talk about. So first, let's discuss network performance. First and foremost, let's talk about images because images generally can be the most expensive thing when you are pulling the data and also rendering it in the client. So we can use a microservice to pull specific image sizes so that we're not just pulling one fixed image size across all different viewports. And then we also want to pull a good optimized version of it using web P, otherwise PNG, and also make sure the images are minified and tinified. Second, we want to use a good compression headers so gzip or bottle, preferably bottle because it's more performant and it was made for web. Next, let's talk about the rendering performance. So in terms of rendering performance, I've already discussed the hybrid approach for using server-side rendering versus client-side rendering. We can also discuss virtualization. So that essentially means that when we are infinite scrolling, if the nodes start to get too large on the page, instead of keep appending new nodes on the page, we can actually just have a fixed number of nodes on the page. And as we scroll, we can replace the content of the existing nodes with the new content. And then if we scroll back up, we replace the existing um, nodes with the old content. So we are just essentially replacing nodes rather than creating nodes. I've already also talked about patching tickets. This will be important. Uh, but yes, we can use infinite scrolling and inter uh, intersection observer to make that to be performed. Now let's talk about JavaScript performance. The first thing we can focus on is making sure we are splitting our bundles. Um, 
So we're not essentially loading our vendors and our make critical app stuff all at once. We split the bundles and really just load what we need. And so right here, one of them is called import what you need. You lazy import non-critical resources, such as models and etc. Next, we use Webpack for polyfills and compression so that things are supported in older browsers. Uh, but we want to try to reduce polyfills as much as possible because the more polyfills we add, the more code we're essentially going to compile later on. Next, uh, we want to try to use inline CSS for JS for specific components. If you're working with global styles, then you can use a CSS file. But if you're working with individual components, then inline the CSS in JS so that it, it, be, it can be lazy loaded correctly. And we want to unit test all functionalities so that everything is test-driven development and we're not just dependent on manual testing here. In terms of accessibility, we're going to follow all of the best practices here. We want to make sure things are screen reader friendly. So we'll be using area attributes across everything. So area live and other area attributes so that things can be translated well through screen, read uh, screen readers. Then we also want to support keyboard navigation using tab index so that people can easily navigate through their keyboard. We want to support rem fonts so that when people increase their screen size or decrease their screen size, the fonts will scale up and down accordingly. And now we can talk about observability, which is going to be very important for our case too. We want to ensure we have proper tracking in place that tracks in views, clicks, basically everything, so that we can understand where our impression rates are, click-through rates are, and so forth, so that we can do experiments and A-B test things and improve things as time goes on. We also want to incorporate logging, um, such as error logs, success logs, and so forth. Uh, we can use a platform like Datadog to actually monitor, monitor that in real time. This will enable us to uh, do performance tracking, such as TTI, TTR, uh, which is essentially time to interactive. And this will allow us to make performance improvements if we are noticing that our latency is not looking very good. And yeah, it will allow us to monitor for errors and volume tracking as well. The final topic I want to discuss in this video is basic front-end security. We want to make sure we implement the best practices here. Uh, so first and foremost is XSS, which is cross-site script, scripting attacks. Uh, if you're using a framework like React, it comes with sanitization built into it automatically, so you don't have to sort of build this yourself. But if we're not, then we want to make sure all of our HTML is sanitized correctly. We can use the DOM Purify API to make sure things are sanitized correctly. We also want to make sure that we're using the correct content security policy headers so that we're requesting data and we know that it's coming from a trusted source. Next, we want to also implement some sort of force policy, which makes sure that the content that we are receiving data from is secure and we're receiving it from one particular resource that we trust, rather than just receiving data from any particular resources that's outside of our domain. Last but not least, we want to use HTTPS because that's a lot more secure and performant. And that is pretty much it. Uh, this is a lot to cover in this video. I hope it was informative and I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you can just take a second and press the like button and subscribe to my channel. And with that, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and take care. Goodbye.